Greg, and welcome to everybody else. We'll go ahead and get started here today. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've got our uh, some of our senior management team here today uh, to talk about uh, having those difficult discussions and addressing some of those difficult moments that we all faced over the past year. And um, so we're going to approach this in a couple of different ways, both how we've uh, had discussions internally, how we've had discussions with our client partners, and, and just have a, a, a conversation amongst our team. And if you have questions, please feel free to submit those on the Q&A. You, know, you can also put those in the chat, and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start things off, uh, Greg. And you know, in 2020, uh, it was a pretty wild year. We had the pandemic, and then we also faced uh, social unrest. Uh, you know, that really started with the, the murder of George Floyd. And that sparked a lot of discussions internally. It sparked discussions everywhere. Uh, in the wake of that, what did you feel was the most important message as the president and CEO of TMG that you had to our team at that time? Great. Well, um, thanks, Joe. And thanks, everybody, for joining us for uh, this dialogue. Um, uh, so yeah, what a year, right? Um, I, I think there's a whole series of things and I think we actually had to, had to back up and I don't wanna not address George Floyd, but as part of a bigger series of conversations that I think as leaders, we have to step into. Um, and really that started for us a couple of years ago on some major conversations, but with regard to 2020, certainly the beginning of the pandemic, we had to start approaching some conversations about what was happening, how that might impact our business, how that might impact our clients. And then of course we had George Floyd, a, a huge issue for our, our company. But I think the process is the same. How do you engage in difficult conversations? And I think the key is to enter into that with three primary motivations, humility, transparency, and empathy and creating the space for there to be a dialogue about difficult subjects and difficult things. That seems to have proven out for us over the course of this year with what I hear back from our team about how much they appreciated the opportunity to engage in the discussion um, in, a, in a learning way, but with those three elements embedded in it. Yeah, you know, when that happened and we brought the team together to have that initial discussion, that was one of the most open discussions we've had that touched on some pretty sensitive things. Derek, you joined us about three weeks before that happened. Uh, and that was one of your first interactions uh, with the entire company on a, a Zoom call together. What was your reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, it was a reassurance that I was in the right space. Um, I have articulated this as many times as I could possibly uh, do this over the course of the past year, but I have never felt uh, a part of more, uh, a more supportive team um, and a more mindful team of, of themselves and of our surroundings. And everyone uh, within tally management has the drive and determination um, to see our world a greater place. It's a part of our core mission and, um, and being led um, through uh, this, this evolution of, of so many um, spaces within the association world um, in our professional cycle um, by this leadership has been um, a joy to be a part of. Uh, so I know that's not where you <laughs> thought I was gonna go with this, but it's where I went um, and, and mean, it just being, uh, being here and inspired by Greg and, and hearing um, the thoughts of you, Ethan and Diane and even Lauren and Ed on the, the senior team, um, it, it's been, it's helped me grow as an individual and as a professional. Um, and I, I feel valued and, and honored to be a part of um, this team and, and look forward to us moving the needle forward for our clients and our team members uh, back at TMG headquarters. Yeah. You know, when that happened, it, it was some sensitive conversations, things that we have not had those types of discussions about race, about some some issues that typically don't get discussed, uh, certainly within a company setting. And uh, you're not going to get to that until you do have those conversations, until your team feels safe to do that. Uh, I'll throw it to Ethan or Diane, if you have any 
comments as we kind of reflect back on that time when we first started those conversations? I mean, I'll jump in. I think it it goes back to, to kind of what Greg kicked off the conversation, talking about creating a safe space and, and getting people comfortable to be able to to have a dialogue about sensitive or, or difficult issues, be able to ask questions, um, be able to, to feel comfortable sharing their, their own personal perspectives um, and, and doing that in an intentional way. I think that, uh, I think we already had a, a culture like that and we were a little bit more thoughtful about bringing specific conversations to the forefront, which triggered a lot of open and honest dialogue, which, which was very healthy. Yeah, I think the, the thing that always resonated with me or has resonated with me following that is, is folks that said, I didn't even know how to enter into the conversation with either colleagues or just to have it with a stranger. And I, I think that we kind of also tried to model, how do you do that um, so that you can take that first step? Because the only way we're gonna solve some of these issues is through better communication and understanding each other. And the only way to do that is through dialogue. So then you have to know, how do I step into this, particularly if I'm feeling really threatened, overwhelmed, or I don't, I feel I don't know enough to even do that. Well, okay, we, we can all talk about that and, and help take that step. Um, here's some language to use, right? Help me understand X. Right away, you've stepped in, um, in a way that you might not have felt comfortable doing before, or tell me about. And suddenly the world opens up, a dialogue begins, and you start learning and interacting. Yeah, and then we took that same philosophy that we use internally and we leveraged it externally um, with uh, city partners like Detroit and Minneapolis and facilitating these conversations, actually helping them start the dialogue amongst their stakeholders. And so actually using the same processes, tools that we are leveraging internally um, for our external um, partners and clients to help elevate uh, what they were doing uh, and continue to do that today. You know, talking about external partners, there are, around that same time, you were appointed TMG's chief diversity officer. And one of the first things you did was develop this idea around bringing together representatives from our client partners, our association clients, uh, to form a DEI task force uh, that's going to address a few different things. Um, some organizations put out statements, some did not, um, for various reasons. What advice do you have for those that haven't uh, or have felt they haven't gone far enough? Um, what advice do you have to get them involved? Yeah, so I mean, I'll just start with the idea of creating the task force. Um, it was a, a, a collective body. It is a collective body of ideas, of, of thoughts, um, a, a, an opportunity for us to bring together our partners across industries around something that is so um, simple yet very complicated uh, that addresses all, all aspects of our world. And so collectively we can, we can have conversations and um, determine uh, structures and ideas and resolutions um, around everything from leadership management and, and growth um, within the communities uh, that, that the individuals represent, um, back to designing these statements and, and articulating uh, feelings towards um, things that are happening in the world that may impact the individuals within these associations. And, and that's the piece that, that we ultimately, at the very end of the day, we are all human. We all feel in, um, and relate to uh, current events and things that are happening. Uh, and no one wants to see anyone hurt or um, without um, access. Uh, and so this, this group, this embodiment really examines everything from um, leadership within the association space to actual action. Um, and ensures that diversity um, rings true in everything and, and that people feel included. And as we think towards these statements that are, that are being um, made uh, 
around the systemic injustice uh, within our world or, um, or uh, racism or um, marginalization. Um, it's important for everyone to step up in and take an active stance to ensure that um, we all are represented in an equal way. And again, going back to uh, the, the things that we I've seen here at, um, at Tally, um, Greg has done an amazing job at not just um, initiating these conversations um, within our team, but also involving the team in these statements. And as organizations think towards um, releasing uh, statements around the, the, the things that are going on in the world as they may relate to the individuals within their organizations or their, their memberships, involving those voices um, that may not be represented all the time is very, very important. Uh, having my words is one thing, but when I combine my words with Ethan's and Diane's and Joe's and Greg's, we get something completely different and elevate it. Um, that, ex that, that, that tone changes and we're able to then communicate more of a rich and, and, un and foundational um, message out to uh, an audience. Yeah. You know, you Oh, go ahead, Diane. Sorry, I, I was just going to, you know, chime in and, and just say, Derek, I, I completely agree with you there. You know, I think the uncomfortable reality is that a lot of the disparity that we are seeing is based in large part on policy decisions and businesses of all sizes. And so we really do have a core role to play there in order to start to generate some of this change. So, you know, the, the talking and the listening and um, you know, I think those are all great components, but there definitely has to be action tied to that as well. And so in the positions that we're in, having influence on that, we can have um, impact there if we come together. Yeah, Diane, that's a great point. I was going to actually ask you uh, a question there. When we talk about leadership and uh, putting action behind words, you know, all the discussions you've had have led to a different mindset amongst our CAD. How do we hire people? What's our priority when we hire people? When we talk about compensation for our team, the mindset has changed over the past year. Diane, how have you seen that mindset change, at least from a corporate level, and then uh, considering us as a, an employee-owned company, uh, mm -hmm. what that mindset has shifted over the past year? Um, yeah, I, I think I have seen change. I, I think we definitely need to see more change. Um, especially at the corporate level. And I think one of the biggest components that we see is, you know, basically this income gap, this wealth gap within our country. And we are in a position where, you know, based on everything that's been happening over this past year, the, the pandemic, um, the inequalities, all of that has basically um, exaggerated and made this wealth gap so much bigger than what it has already been in the past. And so how do we impact that? What do we do? Um, how, do we, how do we bring that in, back into proportion? And you know, there are several things that you can do as an organization. You can look at your compensation practices. You can look at your recruiting practices. Um, you know, how do you impact in those areas? How do you eliminate the potential for unconscious biases to get into any of those policies or practices that you have? And I, I think it expands even beyond just the, the HR component and expands to, you know, as Derek had touched on, your membership, your board leadership, um, your registration at your events. How do you ensure that these are all inclusive environments? Um, you know, here at TMG, we did implement uh, or put in place an employee-owned um, stock program back in 2018. And that was just one way, our way of basically trying to narrow that wealth gap to ensure that our employees do have an ownership stake and they can generate long-term wealth. And I think the more you see of that, um, the more it will help. Yeah. You know, we've, we've talked a, a lot about um, the discussions we've had around systemic inequalities over the past year that we've faced. At the same time, we've been facing a, a global pandemic, which has disrupted uh, our business, our clients' business, uh, on top of this, 
Ethan, you spend a lot of your time talking with our boards, uh, going through uh, how they have reacted to the pandemic and then what's that strategy going forward? Have you noticed uh, a strategy shift, a mindset shift uh, as they've had to confront the pandemic? Yeah, well, I think there are a lot of parallels. So confronting kind of unpredictability, uh, ambiguity related to the pandemic, upheaval, you know, that we've all been, been talking about that's been going on around us. Um, so short answer, yes. I mean, I think from a philosophical perspective, obviously recognizing the need to listen, the need to facilitate dialogue, um, making an attempt to, to both acknowledge and, and try and overcome blind spots that might exist in, in not only an organization's leadership, but potentially the organization at, at large. Um, I've seen a greater recognition of the association's power to convene and, and influence change um, and navigate unpredictability and obstacles while also understanding that all those solutions might not come from within. So, you know, a parallel on the operational uh, on the operational side is a, is you know, a shift to becoming less insular or less proprietary, uh, at least having the openness to explore more collaborative opportunities, um, which not only opens up the door to potentially better delivering on mission, but there can be real business drivers, uh, particularly if you exist in an industry or within a marketplace that has become fragmented. So a focus on maximizing impact, even if that impact isn't solely delivered through your organization can be rewarding for everybody. And I think that mindset has been a reaction to everything going on around us. Simply, you know, a desire to move forward in a more collective manner. I think that brings up a really good point, Ethan. When I think about, you know, sitting in some conversations with a variety of different groups over the course of this past year and kind of everyone feeling to some degree powerless. Um, and to help turn that mindset that no, actually every one of us has not just the, the power and the ability, but I would say the responsibility to lean in on these issues and, and contribute some way somehow. And when one of the things that's excited me most about this is look at the world we're part of, associations. They have the opportunity to have such a bigger voice not just in by themselves, but collectively within the industry, across industries, the entire nonprofit sector, we do have power. We do have the ability to change the dialogue, but that means stepping in, that means leaning in, and that means, to Derek's point, we have to do more than just talk about it. We have to take steps to fix it, take steps to do things about it, and I think that's the one thing that worries me is that I think we've been here before folks on this very same issue. And there's been a lot of talk, a lot of statements put out, but unless there's action, then that becomes meaningless. And so I think our, our ongoing issue is, is how do we actually ensure that there's going to be active steps and ongoing steps. This isn't one and done. So, for this issue, and again, I would say any difficult issue, the same processes that we've talked about applies, the same ability to impact applies, but you need to keep consistent pressure and then widen the, the group that you're talking with and talking to and engaging in the entire process. But if we don't kind of buy that, and that's the only way change happens at the individual level and then start pushing it out. And um, so I think that's the, the beauty that I find in the association space about the collective impact we actually can have if we own it and start using it. So, and this is, that, and this, oh, go ahead, Diane. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I, I think that starts internally with your teams as well. And so make sure that you are um, empowering your teams with the information and the tools that they need in order to have an impact, in order to weigh in. Um, in order to to work with their members and, and registrants or, or boards. And, you know, in order to do that, something as simple as um, your financial statements, you know, full transparency, make sure that your team understands your operations, make sure your team understands the impact that um, the, the activities of the organization have on the financial component of it, and then how they themselves 
can impact that because it expands across all areas. Yeah. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask a quick practical question, Greg. We've had a lot of organizations react to the past year, and over the past six months, it's been strategy. You've, you've got to start planning a strategy around this. Mm -hmm. How do you have that uh, as an association executive working with volunteers? What's that conversation? How do you drive them to move from reactive to having that discussion, to being proactive in the face that we're, we're still in a pandemic, we're coming out of it. How do you get them to focus forward now? Yeah, well, it really is, you know, one of the role of any board is to uh, have foresight. Um, and to discuss um, foresight. What does the future look like for our industry? What does the future look like for you know, our, our members? Um, and, and you've got to engage in that and leave time and space for that to be a dialogue as opposed to we've got 10 minutes to do this on the agenda and then we've got to go back to operational stuff. This is, I would say, the primary role of the board um, is to look downstream six months a year, two years, three years, and, and look at what's happening and say, are we doing everything we could and should be doing to impact this? And I think that always starts for me with who's sitting around the table. And inevitably, in the work I do in associations literally all around the globe, somebody's not at the table who should be at the table. And um, until you kind of address that, it's hard to have a lot of credibility in the space. So you kind of have to start with who's around the table and then saying, how do we get more around the table of whatever voices are missing, of whatever representation we should have, and then take a real close look at your organization, your industry, and say, what's, what's keeping us from being more reflective? What's keeping us from engaging with the broader audience that our industry represents and who should be um, at the table or who we should be talking with about these issues. You know, too often, it's a group of people trying to figure out how to solve a problem without ever talking to the people that are actually the main issues around the problem or that are feeling the effects of what we've done as a society for 400 years. So um, you've got to engage that way and you've got to start that way. But I think it's about foresight. Who are we? What do we want to be? What's happening in our space? What, what is our role? to impact the things in our world that are having an impact on our members' lives, on our, on our organization and our industry. Here's a, here's a great document out there um, by the Bridge Span Group. Uh, and, and it's a conversation starter, how to begin thinking long and short. And it gives you um, tips and you know, ideas on how to start having those difficult conversations at the board level how to start thinking for that longer term impact and what that means and how you can affect that. Um, we'll drop it in our, our resources as well so that you can get access to that. Derek, you were gonna say something. Yeah, uh, the, uh, this is a journey, uh, folks. This, is, this isn't gonna happen overnight. Um, and to Greg's earlier point, um, we now need to look towards quantifying and actually measuring our success in this space. Um, we can't just put out a statement and think that that's going to be the end of it. We can't just gather our teams together for these one-on-one -on -one, uh, talks. We need to now put in measurements um, to ensure that we are actually exceeding our expectations in this space. Uh, and that's where the growth occurs. Um, that's how the journey continues. Uh, and so, uh, that's, that's the challenge that, that we all have moving forward is to continue this journey as opposed to just having it um, be just a statement or just an initiative. Um, there needs to be true measurement behind the things that we do and the impact it has on either our internal or and or external uh, worlds. I think a really great example of that is our own goal um, from a DE&I perspective about our staff um, in our company. And we've set a, a goal for that. And then you start saying, how do we impact and measure against that goal? And what are we going to actually do? And you know, so often that conversation starts with, we can't find qualified people. And then it stops and we go right back to what we've always done. And um, you know, that's not the answer. Um, the answer is then perhaps we're not looking in the right places. 
and perhaps we haven't made our organization appear open and welcoming to different types of people and that we've got to address those issues. So, you know, that's where um, one of our actions has been to align ourselves and reach out and partner with the local HBCUs here in the um, greater Philadelphia area to talk about how we can look at in, uh, in impacting and creating a pipeline for internships, for hiring opportunities amongst their alumni, um, amongst their graduating um, seniors. It's those sorts of actions that all of a sudden we can't say there aren't qualified people out there, but now we're starting to access where we can find the folks that would be willing to join our organization, have the skill set to join our organization, but would not have replied perhaps to a open Indeed um, call without any other effort on our part. Um, so it's those sorts of things that I think we start saying, what are the actual steps we're going to take? Now let's look at measuring um, based on the results of those steps. Right. I mean, Joe, um, Lauren, and I are participating in a Black Career Fair in a couple weeks um, to review resumes of um, Black college kids and, and help them in their career uh, growth and development. That's something, that's a, that's a step that puts us there in that space and allows us to interact and engage in a, in a community that may not know anything about um, tally management. And so those types of initiatives, I think each organization can seek out those opportunities to reach out to various groups. Um, if there's a space um, that they find that they are um, not really excelling in, um, in representation. Yep. Eric, do you want to just share the name of that organization just so everyone has I knew you were going to ask that. Uh, give me one second. <laughs> it's, it's <internet. laughs> right. Yes, it's intern. I think intern X. Intern X. If anyone, and we'll we'll get that information out to anyone that may have an interest in participating in that. Uh, so we're we're coming up on our, our time here. So if you do have questions, please go ahead and submit those. I've got one here. Uh, how has the virtual work environment impacted your ability to be inclusive in hiring? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question, and it's one of the things I'm probably most excited about as we go into this. I mean, truly, it opens up the world. Um, but in terms of access, right, it's what we're seeing play out on many different levels, whether it's uh, participation in events um, or this whole issue around hiring is that literally we can now find the specific talent that we want, almost regardless of where it is in the world or the country, um, which again opens up those avenues, opens up those ways um, to increase the, the diversity in our case that, that we might be looking for. So I think the remote work opportunity just with virtual and every other area that we're seeing opens up access to groups and areas and people who would not otherwise have had access or the ability to, to connect through. So I think that's a, a real benefit of the virtual world we're now in. Any other questions out there? Uh, feel free to submit those on the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and I would go so, ahead and you know, that. I guess I would just say, um, Joe, I think while we focus this around the DE and I, when you think about any difficult conversation the, and, and difficult issue that we face, the kind of practices that we've talked about apply to every single one of those. Um, they've applied to us as we've talked about where is our company coming through this, those same sort of difficult conversations. Um, what other opportunities are out there? What are the other challenges that we face in dealing with this pandemic, the future of our clients, the events, all those sorts of things are challenging conversations, but you've got to lean into them um, and engage everyone in them for them to feel that they can participate, that they can bring ideas, they can bring perspectives, and that's how we all grow to find a better solution to whatever the issue is. So the principles are the same. Um, we face some really unique issues coming out of 2020 that I hope um, enable us to do better as a country um, and do better as an industry, do better as an organization, and hopefully do better as individuals to recognize our role and opportunity to help solve. Uh, we have a, a question there. How has the conversation about diversity and inclusion impacted your hiring process? both how you hire for your team and how you guide your clients in their hiring process. So, so I think it's a little bit that we've uh, shared in terms of really 
changing and being very specific about where do we go to try and find the folks that we want to have um, apply. And that means really getting specific about where you should go and getting creative. Um, and that's where something like forming uh, relationships with HBCUs or other community groups um, that represent groups that are not not who your staff may be or represent more of who you're looking for to increase your, your diversity. It's really about, I think, thinking outside what you've traditionally done and then being very intentional and creative about where you go. Yeah. You know, one thing through the, the last couple of hiring processes that we've had is having a diverse hiring team. So as you go through the interview process, make sure you have a diverse team internally that's participating in that. That can give you different perspectives. Uh, and then taking your time to assess the candidates that you have. Have you done enough to find a diverse pool? Um, and then also there's other things that we haven't been able to implement all the way, but I know are is on the radar, ways to reduce uh, unconscious bias in the hiring process. So um, removing names from resumes um, and, and trying to reduce some of those uh, areas for unconscious bias that, that seem to come up in the, the hiring process. I think a, another part of that is also to make sure that you have compensation scales in place. And so in order to stop the history of, um, you know, wage discrimination, um, don't ask the questions on what were you making previously? Don't ask the questions on what is it that you're looking to make for this position? Because that potentially continues a trend um, of that discrimination and you don't want that to continue. So you wanna ensure that you have really structured and solid compensation packages in place that take into account everything and don't potentially bring in those unconscious biases as well. Hey, Joe, I think we have a really good question from Peggy um, who's asked, how has this process impacted your relationship with your clients? Um, I think that's a really great question. And I don't know that we necessarily have a a definitive answer to that, although I'll let certainly Derek and, and Ethan lean in here, but I think to some degree, um, to be able to talk about these issues ourselves um, internally within TMG, hopefully reflects the type of company we wanna be, um, and then what that extends to to now our clients, uh, number one, and how we interact with them. So I hope it's reflective of, of that. And then more importantly, as you heard, I think Joe say and Ethan, we are kind of leaning in with our clients to say again, that we all have a role. We all have a responsibility here, including all of our clients to engage in this discussion at their board and leadership levels. Um, because something as big as um, equity in the United States of America is we all own that. That's on all of us. So we all have the opportunity to help solve that problem. So I think bringing that and kind of putting it there, right? Uh, at least we can help engage in that conversation, help that dialogue. Um, obviously it's up to the individual client board what they choose to do with that. But I think we feel it's our responsibility to bring it, uh, help have that conversation. And then to the degree we're asked, help guide with some ideas and solutions on how we think that can be addressed inside each client organization. Yeah, and you know, there's, it's a two-way street. There's, there's gotta be alignment on both sides around a culture fit for uh, how we work with our clients and how they work with us. There's gotta be a, an alignment on culture and mission there. Uh, and that's something we've taken seriously this year. You know, we, we do analyze the types of groups we're gonna work with and who we work with and make sure that we're open and transparent about what the expectations are between the two. Um, and that sometimes means difficult decisions have to be made. Right, and I would even say to that on the association level, even on the event level, um, understanding the partners that you are working with and what is their position on a lot of these external um, uh, things. I think that's, that is very vital for us to move the needle collectively. We need to partner with individuals, with people um, that share the same values. And then for those who don't, we need to ensure that we are educating them about the importance of these values to us as an organization, as people, um, so that they understand that this is something that 
isn't going away. And if, if you want to partner with us, if you want our business, if you want um, access, um, then, then we expect your, um, your undivided attention and support in this area. That brings up a couple of uh, great points. What I really think you're talking about there is kind of vendor selection, right? When some of those first things we all say, well, what can we really do as an organization? Well, for one thing, you can support vendor um, relationships that are um, black owned. Um, there are things you can do here that are steps you can take, but even in just looking at um, the, the settings for meetings and events, who is speaking from the stage? Who is on the stage? and we're still not very good, or there's lots of opportunity, let me put it that way, for broadening that representation of who is on stage, who is being asked to speak, who's given the opportunity to get up in front of their peers. And obviously that is based to some degree on what type of presentation is it and all the rest of it. But I think you, we need to look even at that level and that's part of our role to bring that to our boards and our planning committees to say, let's just really take a look at this and make sure this is reflective of who you want to represent and how you want to show your organization um, to the members and to the outside world. Yeah, and, and I think then, just to add to that, who's getting paid to speak? Mm. That goes back to Diane's uh, point about uh, elevating everyone's, the entire community's financial uh, position within the space. Sorry, Ethan. Well, I just think this goes back to, to you know, the blind, the, the blind spot comment and breaking, busting, you know, attempting to bust through your spheres of kind of familiarity. You might be doing things that are un, unintentionally, you know, further, furthering an issue. Um, and from a content perspective, and I, I bring this from an organization that I volunteer for, not, not a client we represent, but we spend a lot of time talking about just that. How do we be, become more represented, representative from a content perspective? perspective and not only bringing uh, DE&I content, but the, the regular content providers or the subject matter experts and how do we diversify that pool and be, and be more thoughtful um, uh, you know, from that perspective as well. I know one of our clients had a fascinating discussion about you know, the issue of women in science and um, you know, how could they ensure that they were going to have more women represented um, in those roles, those speaking roles, those opportunities, and really put together a, a committee just to address that. And not uh, A, to share the experience and frustration, and then B, now how do we start to solve it? And it's those sorts of things that can be represented across the spectrum um, to be, again, intentional about what, what organizations are going to do about it. I think you're muted, Joe. You're muted, Joe. <laughs> um, well, thank you, everyone. I don't see any other questions. I'll give it another uh, 30 seconds here if there are any more questions that want to come in. Uh, if not, any other final comments uh, from our team here that they want to share? I'll just kind of reiterate, I, it's one of those things where we live through history, we are at one of those moments. And I, again, think we all have the opportunity to play a role um, in history and have an impact. And um, there is so much need right now uh, in almost any direction you look in in our country for, for leadership, for thinking differently, for thinking more inclusive, for acting, um, to actually start solving some of these problems that have been sitting in front of us for literally uh, well, <laughs> hundreds of years in some case, um, decades. Uh, it's, it's been, we've got big issues, but the only way we're gonna solve these issues is if we start collaborating, start thinking differently and start taking action collectively or as individuals. Yeah. Uh, I see Diana asked a question of any training resources you recommend. I'll uh, have our team pull that together and we'll send it out to all the attendees on email. All right, I don't see any other questions. So uh, I will go ahead and close this out here by saying thank you to our attendees for spending a few minutes with us this afternoon. Thank you to our team as well for the discussion. Uh, we will have this recording posted on our website and look forward to seeing everyone at a future webinar. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Everyone.